April 19th, 2021 uh, meeting of the James City County Planning Commission Working Group to order. Uh, Ms. Cook, would you please call the roll? Yes, Mr. O'Connor. I think you're muted, Tim. I am, sorry, I'm on a new computer, so I am here, thanks. Jerry O'Connor is an at-large member. Ms. Leverance? Here. Ms. Leverins is an at-large member. Mr. Polster? Here. Mr. Polster represents the Jamestown District. Dr. Rose? Here. Dr. Rose represents the Roberts District. Ms. Null? Present. Ms. Null represents the Stonehouse District. Mr. Krop? Here. Mr. Krop represents the Powhatan District. Mr. Haldeman? Here. Mr. Haldeman represents the Berkeley District and is chair of the Planning Commission. Ms. Wortman? Here. Ms. Wortman represents the community participation team, and we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll remind everybody, please use the hand raise function. I'll, I gave myself a C minus for recognizing it last week I'll, or last meeting. I'll try to do a little better this time, but uh, uh, that may make things go pretty smoothly. Um, as you know, uh, on September 8th, 2020, the board readopted the continuity of government ordinance, which under certain circumstances permits this committee to conduct today's meeting by electronic or telephonic means without a quorum of members present. May I please have a motion for adoption of the resolution that you have in, uh, in your uh, packet? So moved, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Um, Although these meetings have not had a dedicated public comment period, uh, we did allow public comment to be collected through several means. Uh, Ms. Cook, do we have any um, public comments submitted? No, uh, no comments submitted since the packet was sent. Great, thank you. And uh, while you have the microphone, would you please handle the introductions? Yes, thank you. Um, I am Ellen Cook, Principal Planner, and joining me today from James City County are Paul Holt, Timmy Rosario, Thomas Weisong, Tom Leininger, Carrie Costello, Brett Meadows, John Reisinger, Tori Haynes, Vaughn Poller, Marion Payne, and Tony Small. Also joining us are our partners in this comprehensive plan update, our consultants Vlad Gorilovic and Todd Gordon from EPRPC, and Leanne King from Clarion Associates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have um consideration of minutes from the January 20th and February 8th, 2021 uh, meetings. Did anyone uh, have any amendments or deletions move, or? Move to approve, this is Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all. All right, first up on the agenda is land use chapter. Um, and we have Mr. Weissong and Mr. Leiner. Yes, sir. Well, good afternoon to the working group. This meeting will be a continuation of the review and discussion of certain components of the land use section materials. The working group reviewed and provided guidance on land use chapter materials in December, January, and February, which have guided these revisions. We also have received a few emails prior to this meeting containing editorial changes and other ideas for discussion, which is much appreciated. For this afternoon, the revised and additional rural lands and open space chapter text and the future land use map designation description and development standards are the two main topics for discussion. In lieu of a PowerPoint presentation, staff plans to give a brief overview of the changes in each of these topics, dividing our discussion into those two categories, which summarize the items that are conveyed in the land use memo, though they are in a slightly different order. The first category are the proposed revisions to the land use chapter test, X which includes new rural lands and open space preserva preservation text. The second category are the proposed revisions to the designation description and development standards, which does include changes to density in rural lands, as well as the mixed use designations. Of course, these topics do intersect with one another, so we certainly do not wanna stifle the continuation of what has been an excellent discussion on these matters, but we thought this approach might facilitate and organize discussion a bit. So the first topic is rural lands and open space. Your packet includes an updated summary of public input pertaining to open space and rural lands. Your packet also includes the updated open space and rural character preservation analysis, 
which has been revised per the working group's comments, as well as illustrative depictions of three different lot size development concepts for rural lands, which were taken from the character design guidelines questionnaire. There have also been revisions to the land use chapter text. The key principles described in the open space and rural character preservation analysis document have been incorporated into the new considerations for implementing rural land tools section, which is within the growth management portion of the chapter. Staff has also prepared draft language addressing open space and the new open space preservation section within the growth management portion of the land use text. Staff has also proposed relocating the open space tool decision tree to an appendix rather than being within the text. And I would believe we did receive some emails over the weekend with recommendations regarding the open space and rural character preservation analysis document, which is much appreciated. So if I may, I'll pause here and turn things over to the working group for discussion and any questions you may have for staff specific to the new text that was in the rural land section of the technical report or the revisions to the open space and rural character preservation analysis. Thank you. Does anybody have any uh, comments or? Questions? Um, I had a, a couple. I'm not sure this is the exact time to to do it. I, is the uh, land use chapter? Is that what we're talking about? Or yes, sir. So okay. the the two items would be the the revised open space paper the consultants put together mm -hmm. for that new text for rural lands within the land use chapter. Um, I had a couple of editorial issues, but I, I won't bring them up if you can consider those separately, I think. Um, the level two medium, medium, medium town and suburban center, is that part of this? I'm sorry for being a little. Oh, not a problem. I, I probably didn't explain clearly. Um, so for the first part, this focus would be just on the rural lands. And okay. I think what I'm about to get into, if there are no questions, would be the changes to the uh, designation and descriptions and development standards for rural lands, which gotcha. is that okay. proposed. And then after that, it would be mixed use. Okay. Uh, I think I, that was I'll, the bulk of the emails we got, but I did want to make sure that folks had a chance to talk about the text if they wanted to. Okay. I'll keep my mouth shut now. A anybody else? There's a couple hands up, Jack. Um, Jenny, oh, I think, was the first uh, Jen, one. Jenny's first, yep. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, I raised a question. I think this is the appropriate time to talk about it uh, with regard to the 20 acre standard. And um, I know Frank uh, also had a much more eloquent uh, question, eloquently put question about the about the 20 acre standard. And I wondered if now was the time to talk about that. Well, if I may, if folks want to move into the um, that 20 acre standard, um, I'm happy to give the brief presentation on those changes, and then uh, then it'll be my turn to be quiet and hand it over to you all. Let's, if that would be acceptable to the working group. Let's let's finish this topic first, and then we'll move on. Okay, uh, Tom, um, Rich, you have your hand up. I I did, and I um, I think this is. Uh, an, an okay place to mention it. It had to do with the um, uh, page 97, the rural lands designation description table. There had been some some edits uh, made to that, and I think it's it's very good. And and of course, it's emphasizing to uh, keep the topography, vegetation, vistas, and so on and so forth. What I was wondering, and I may have missed it in the in the GSAs, but what I was wondering is. Uh, we had also discussed a little bit in um, in an earlier meeting about the possibility of of um, imposing uh, scenic setbacks or scenic easements or whatever along certain roads in the county that that may have uh, an unusually uh, nice vista. And I was wondering whether Tom whether that um, would be a, an appropriate 
insert on that table, whether there's whether that's a little too specific and would more appropriately be addressed in a as an action item. Uh, I just wasn't sure, but I wanted to bring that up again um, in the event that that I missed uh, where that ended up. Yes, I believe that would probably be best suited for an action item in the GSAs, um, which I know Tom Leininger has been working on. And I believe, Ellen, please jump in if, if I've got the scheduling wrong. I think we have that scheduled uh, potentially for the upcoming meetings to look at the GSAs once again. Okay. Um, yeah, I would have to check in on that suggestion about the uh, maybe the setbacks or the overlays for those specific roads and see mm -hmm. where we are on that. Okay, and, and and I thought that might be the answer that 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 table that was too specific a comment for that table, but I wanted to at least uh, bring it up uh, and, and verify that it's further down the road. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you did, Frank. I had the same kind of a comment in the text of the chapter itself on page LU nine, and in the document there's a reference. Uh, to uh, the um, goal strategies and actions, and specifically, they cite you cite uh, LU seven seven one seven two and seven three, and to uh, the point that Rich just made, seven three and seven two specifically talk about that. So, I, I, I don't know that the chapter text referring to an LU without an explanation makes much sense if you can't crosswalk it in some way. Thank you. Thanks. Rich, your hands up. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just slow getting it down. Bear with me. <laughs> I understand. Um, does anybody else care to weigh in on this section? Hearing none, we'll go back to Jenny's um, uh, question about the 20 acres. Um, Mr. Weisung, you want to? Skip to the next uh, topic. Certainly, be happy to. So for the, uh, the next section, the working group previously provided feedback on the rural land designation descriptions and development standards, which has guided the proposed revisions within the DDS. And for reference, staff has provided a simple estimation of rural lands development potential, simply as a reference point for your discussion. The two major changes to the rural lands designation descriptions are that staff deleted a sentence in the rural lands per a working group member recommendation. And this is the sentence that stated residential development is intended to occur inside the primary service area. And the second change, which might be a little more notable, is that staff did include a draft density number of 20 where the text had previously shown an X such that it states the subdivision of lots should occur at a density no greater than 20 acres per residence. This number is intended to reflect public engagement results, including those from round three, as well as information and recommendations in the open space and rural character preservation analysis document. And I, I know we did get some great comments over the weekend and input about this item. So I'll stop there and turn the floor back over to the working group. And I will ask John, would it be possible for you to pull up the uh, rural lands development standard on the screen while they're discussing? Perfect, thank you. Jenny, back to you. Um, do you want to frame your question again, or? Well, um, my simple question was: What is the implication for current landowners of designating this standard? And then I'm going to punt to Frank, who um, had a number of sub questions under that. <laughs> Frank, over to you. Well, I, I mean, it's a discussion that we really need to have. So whether it's five, it, whether you keep it at three, five, 10, or 20, I just chose 20 as an impact to see what would happen and where it would happen. And and uh, uh, it's not that I'm opposed to the either a five, 10, or 20, but if we end up deciding on whatever that number is, it will have to at least make some sense to the folks that live in the lands of the county, who I'm sure Rich will tell you and verify this, that they 
feel a lot of the conservation things are falling onto their backs and nobody else. And so what's in it for them? Uh, and is there any reason that they should get any compensation or should we even consider that at all? And I, I think it's a very open piece. The, the, the point that I was trying to make uh, in my uh, article by showing you all those different graphics is uh, of those 125, I think I pointed out that 108 are uh, in, in an AFD of some sort or another. Um, and so there is that temporary uh, conservation piece. And it's not like that they don't receive a remuneration in terms of reduced uh, uh, tax uh, uh, for that. Uh, and so is, is there something more that can be done? And, and what I've suggested in several times during this, this notion of uh, carbon sequestration for forest lands. Um, and, and believe it or, or not, whether or not we think it's something that's going to happen or not, uh, I, I believe it will. And, and the best proof of that that I can give you is that the state participated in the first auction for carbon sequestration credits and uh, got back something like uh, $40 million, of which they expect during the next three uh, auctions to get about uh, a total of $80 million in just this year. And so there definitely is a, a financial uh, piece to it. I've I've talked to you about the study that's been done. Just a, a brief follow-up to that is that the uh, Rappahannock River Basin uh, will have a pilot in place for Fakir County uh, come this summer, uh, signing folks up. So, so I'm just offering another alternative if you go to a higher density is one is it provides some economic uh, benefit in, to include the value tax. But the other piece that was a suggestion uh, in the, uh, the consultant team's piece was to extend the uh, uh, time period of, um, of an AFD from five years. And in fact, I think the right island is already 10. But, but the point is, is if you participated in the um, carbon sequestration program, uh, it would have to be for a 20 year period. So that, that meets that second piece. So I, I I'm, I'm willing to, to support this, but I think we need to have some sort of a, a document or a discussion that points out to the rural landowners that this is going to be in their economic benefit in both ways. One, in terms of the health of the community, but also the preservation of the environment as well as the rural character. So that, that was the point of, of putting that paper together to say that we're gonna need an argument that makes some sense to the so what test to make this suggestion. And, and that's it for me on this topic. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Yes, and um, I, I wanna compliment Frank on the paper that he produced and the points that he made, uh, the very, very succinctly put and, and some, some great issues to be addressed. And um, I have more of a, a question. I don't remember what year this took place, but it used to be that the buy right development in the rural lands was one house per acre, one dwelling unit per acre. And then uh, maybe it was in the 80s, um, it was changed to one per three acres. And what I uh, was wondering, and if staff doesn't have that information now, um, you know, maybe as our discussion uh, evolves over the next few weeks, uh, are there lessons learned from that from that occurrence? I'm I'm sure there were uh, so many of the same issues raised by going from one acre to three acres as is going to be raised uh, only on a bigger scale when we go to 20 acres. And so, you know, I I, uh, I don't know if it's a case where if a landowner has has property that's already platted. Um, for a few potential future development, does that exclude them? Um, is everybody's property up for the the twenty acre um, uh, by right development uh, limitation, and so on and so forth? So there there are uh, I, I think a lot of questions that we have to be prepared to Frank's point to address, and you know both on the positive side uh, for the landowners, but also. Uh, if there are any lessons learned uh, from the previous go around, if, if things should be done differently or that take other thing, other factors taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Would, um, would anybody consider 
uh, trading county water and sewer for a 20 acre lot, is it, or is that even economically feasible? What do you mean trading? I'm not following you, Jack. Well, we if if we go to 20 acres uh, uh, density, um, that obviously significantly reduces the development capacity of all these parcels. Um, Frank's right; there are uh, AFD benefits, and uh, hopefully soon to come uh, carbon credits. Um, but would it? take some of the sting out of it for the property owners if we offered um, county sewer or county and or county water. Um, there's a, an environmental benefit to having county sewers as opposed to septic fields. Um, so an expense to that. Um, just a question. Um, Would it be okay if I wait in? This is Ellen. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ellen. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, and sorry for. Uh, uh, I see Mr. O'Connor has his hand up as well. Uh -huh. Just uh, briefly, um, I think uh, staff might weigh in that at a 20-acre size, that distri distributes the lots um, in the rural lands in that pattern. Um, uh, the, the building the lines in, in that scenario would probably be a very high cost per, per unit. So yeah, I'm sure you're right. Um, okay. Probably the, the trade off that we have kind of talked to you all about in the past and many others um, in, a, in community conversations is uh, potentially not having the, the independent well requirement and um, having indi allowing uh, independent, I'm sorry, individual wells um, as a potential. Uh, sort of a balancing of the different uh, requirements that are there, sort of a trade-off if lot sizes were increased potentially. Okay, thanks. Thank Tim? Um, thanks, Jack. I think I have two comments and a question. Um, one, I don't know, well, Ellen, uh, Ellen talked about the cost piece, but um, which could be really prohibitive, but I don't know that we want to get into a position where we're extending water and sewer out past other parcels. Um, you know, I, I think of Jolly Pond Road and, and extending out to the, the middle school and the elementary school, you know, it becomes a very easy argument to say, let's tap into it. So if we, um, so I don't, I don't know that I think that's a great idea to um, what potentially happened. Um, you know, I, I think it's a worthy discussion when we, when we look at parcels that may be adjacent to the PSA and the one that comes to mind we just voted on recently was the Marston parcel that, you know, perhaps in exchange for, um, you know, limiting uh, the development size that it makes sense to do it there, but I wouldn't recommend it as a wholesale bypass of, of places in rural lands that are outside the PSA. Um, and then I do just wanna make sure, I didn't see it, but I'm just trying to scroll through. The, a 20 acre lot size, um, and this is a question for staff, it wouldn't adversely impact a family subdivision, um, would it? This is Ellen. Um, uh, it would depend uh, on how the A1 ordinance uh, and the RA ordinance was amended. Um, it, it seems uh, possible to me that that would kind of remain as sort of a separate category with some, some different requirements, uh, as you say, as far as lot size. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to definitively say um, and probably would leave that to um, those considering any ordinance amendments in the future. Okay, because I would I would suggest that if we had a large parcel and somebody was interested in maintaining it for farming or horses or, or something like that, that um, and they want a family subdivision that we would hopefully not 
not penalize somebody um, to to create 20 acre parcels just for for um, for a family subdivision. So. Okay, thank you. Um, this is definitely going to have a an impact on the development capacity, as I said, and and therefore the value of the, the property. The the thing I was thinking about as I was mulling this over is that um, this the potential for this has been on the table for two years. You know, we since the scenario uh, planning idea uh, was was first introduced, and one option was going to be to significantly reduce the development capacity of um, in the rural lands, and that is the scenario that was voted on overwhelmingly by our fellow residents. And um, I think we have to find some way to do that. Um, the, um, other counties that were noted in our packets uh, have, have done it successfully. Um, Albemarle and, and Fuckier and Chesterfield and others. And um, so I'm, uh, I'm in support of this. I don't know if the right number is 20, but I'm in support of a, um, a decrease in density. Uh, Rich, you're back. I'm um, back. I've, I've been uh, clicking and unclicking because I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I'm formulating my my thought completely. But um, I liked Ellen's comment about uh, waving a communal well, for example, uh, on a 20 acre parcel, and it it got me to thinking. And I don't know if there are other jurisdictions that do something like that, where you have somewhat of a sliding scale, where you say, okay. Our ideal is, is 20 acres per dwelling unit. And here are the benefits you get if you comply with that. However, if 10 acres was chosen, there's penalties that a landowner or a developer would pay. And I don't know what those are right now, um, but you know, to give, um, I, I don't know if there's, if there's any jurisdictions that do anything like that, that say, well, here's our goal and this is what we want for rural land development uh, density. However, um, you know, if, if, if the developer or the owner is willing to make some financial sacrifices, we could conceivably go to 10 acres. And that's why I was flipping my hand up and down because I'm not really sure that that makes even makes sense, but I just threw it out there. One, one of the counties in the example had a, a clustering um, mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, to your point, but uh, Tim, uh, put your hand up or there we go. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the the wording that is in staff's draft. Um, <clears throat> is everybody okay with that, or should we? I'm okay with 20. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it meets what we, we want to do, but, but there has to be uh, something that goes to the citizens in the rural areas where somebody sits down with both Mike and Sue Sadler and says, here's what we're thinking and here's why. I mean, this is going to take a bit of a selling. Yeah to get this through. And so we have between now and the first public hearing in June to figure it out if we decide to go with a 20. And so I, I'm with you, Jack, I'm okay with the 20. And I've tried to suggest some ways about making this argument. Yeah. Another point is a lot of people who live in the rural lands don't want subdivisions. You, you saw the big outpouring in York County just a, a, a month ago and, um, successfully fighting off a, a rezoning. Of course, that's something different, but um, you know, a lot of people who live in the rural lands like it just the way it is. So um, politically, I don't, I don't know how that shakes out, but uh, uh, okay, do, uh, before we move on, does anybody else have anything to say about this one paragraph? One last question, Jack, if I may, <laughs> is this something that would lend itself to a discussion at the May 
um, work session with the board, or is that a little bit too volatile of a topic to get feedback from the board on it at, at this point before the public hearings? I'll defer to staff on that. Uh, I, I don't mind bringing it up. I'm going to be there, um, but um, I'll wear my oldest clothes. And uh, <laughs> uh, but staff, anybody, uh, Mr. Holt, you, you have a a good political weather vane. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're too kind as always. <laughs> Over, overselling, maybe overselling my abilities. Um, <laughs> Now, you know, I think I think Ellen uh, Ellen might have mentioned it uh, in general earlier. You know, certainly any of these big, you know, policy changes, and and certainly you, the recommendation here for rural lands is is probably one of the largest. You know, I think um, I think it's going to be very incumbent for the presentation of the materials to the board to cover this item because. You know, at the end of the day, Mr. Polster said it as well. Um, we want to make sure that heading into the public hearings, that you know, we have that information out there. And I think the the again for all of these big policy changes, staff is doing its best to highlight those for the board. Um, so so that they sort of know that that question is coming and that they know that that's a significant recommendation of the PC working group and that they know that that is a uh, significant policy change that's being recommended in direct response to, to a lot of the public input that we've gotten. Um, you know, some of the details about what the ordinance could do or not do, you know, you all have got the flexibility uh, to, to really figure that out when we go in there and amend the ordinance. And, that, and that's when some of the trade-offs get explored. That's when some of the benchmarking with other localities gets done is when, is, is when we revisit this issue by making the ordinance amendments to the A1 district. Um, but I think your, your policy recommendation at this point is pretty clear. Um, and um, no, I think we wanna know that because again, um, don't, don't want that to sort of be out there for the first time at the public hearing stage. We're really trying to get to a point with the Board of Supervisors that at that May business meeting, at that May joint work session, um, to, to where there's sort of general consensus moving forward, especially on the big things that could have an impact on other sections or the models or leave behind models or anything else. So, your comment about um, it, having know, this come up for the first time in a hearing is, is spot on, I think. So, yeah, it's sort of too late at that point. So, you know, in fairness to everybody, so if, if that's if that's um, if there's not consensus to sort of move in that direction, at, at least at the policy level um, from the board, we're going to definitely would want to know that uh, at that May work session. So, you know, and okay. staff and thinking through. Uh, some some items to bring up. We're, we'll have this item on the list specifically. I just think it's so important. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Okay, I, I think we've exhausted this subject. Um, any others on the uh, rural lands development standards or descriptions? Hearing none. Um, Are, are there are, this doesn't exhaust land use so um uh, no sir we've got uh mixed use is next on the menu if you okay. want me to slide into that please do um, thank you great so the uh the mixed use standards have also been revised based on the working group's feedback and their request for additional language in the development standards specifically regarding the desired scale and intensity of development for the mixed use areas. As drafted, the mixed use language is split into two different levels, which are level one and level two, with new language describing each of these levels in the rows titled basic description, the recommended uses and land allocation, and the recommended density and intensity. Uh, please note that there are some differences in the recommended floor area ratio and residential density as compared to the currently adopted language for the mixed use designation. 
The two different levels are linked to the specific area descriptions, such as Toano or Newtown, through the labels that are found in the far left column under each area's name. So level one corresponds to specific areas that are either labeled as rural village center or small town or suburban center. And level two, which is a little bit more intense, corresponds to specific areas that are labeled as medium town or suburban center. And I will note that it's staff's intention to include language in each of the economic opportunity designated areas, noting the adjacent mixed use areas have specific scale and intensity recommendations that should be considered and coordinated uh, with development in the economic opportunity area. Um, staff is still in the process of making other revisions to specific areas um, within the DDS, but we did want to focus on this mixed use and Really hoping to get some feedback from you all on this approach to mixed use. And I do believe we received some helpful emails over the weekend. So with that, I'll stop there and, and turn it back over to the working group for discussion and any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions, comments? I, I submitted a couple that I, I won't repeat them here, but um, any, anybody else? Jenny. Yeah, um, I, I raised a couple of questions um, that I'd like to, do we ha already have five and six story buildings in the county? It's a good question. Uh, we do have a few, I don't have an exact number. Um, well, let me back that up. I know that in Newtown, we do have a few structures that are four stories. I know you asked about five or six stories. Um, and of course, Newtown is a mixed use area. I do believe there is a structure, I think it's a hotel in the uh, Lightfoot area, which designated for mixed use, that is above five stories. Uh, Tom or Tori might have the exact floor count on that one, but that was the only structure I'm aware of that's that size within the county that's designated for mixed use. Okay, I was just, uh, um... Six, five, and six stories didn't didn't seem uh, to fit in my frame of thinking with um, a lot of the other structures around here. So I'll just throw that out. And then um, I also raised a question about um, in the MU descriptions why the area allocated for public and civic and recreation uses is smaller in level two than in level one. That that didn't make sense to me. So perhaps you could explain that. Certainly, sir, I'm just trying to scroll there. Um, and I do think we have Vlad on the call, maybe able to provide some, some context, but um, part of the thinking could be that for the level two, are you referring to the public civic area, Ms. Wortman, that's 5% in level two and 20% in level one? Well, it was, yes, the combined um, public civic recreation. Um, but yeah, it's still smaller in the, in the level two. And, and my, my brain was thinking, well, if there's higher density, why wouldn't, why would they have less space allocated to that? It would make sense that there might be more space allocated to that, but you can probably disabuse me of that thinking. No, Thanks. no, it's a, it's a good question. I think part of the thinking might be that with the, uh, with the level two designation, that's less of a residential component and more of non-residential being intended, although I do think we got some emails from other working group members that had some thoughts on how to change that. And so it may be that the thinking would be with less residential uh, percentage being proposed, there may be less of a less of a need for the public civic area. Um, but it's a it's a good question and certainly something we welcome the working group discussing and pouring over. Thank you. Vlad, maybe you know the answer, right? Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Uh, not exactly the answer, but just a, a consideration uh, for you. Um, 
the level two is uh, higher density, as you point out, and uh, typically higher density areas to have a more urban character um, will have a smaller public civic or open space area. Um, so these are uh, these are actually gross um, rather than net um, kind of allocations of of areas for each level, and that's why you. With higher densities, you tend to have less open space so that you can achieve those higher densities. Um, I, the comments that I submitted earlier, I was wondering why the um, area, residential area in level one is larger than it is in level two. Um, I would think it would be at least no, no greater. Um, also, I'm with Jenny on on uh, anything over four. I actually said we should cap office floors um, at three for the um, no uh, cap office floors at four. I'm sorry, and um, and shrink the residential area for level one to twenty to fifty percent, um, which is more consistent than with level two, unless somebody can disabuse me of that. Well, this is Vlad again, just um, some thoughts from the consultant side on uh, helping put these together. Uh, just to have a differentiation between level one and level two in the residential, non-residential areas was uh, one reason. Um, since level one is slightly less density, usually that's um, you know covered with a little more residential than non-residential. And then on the building heights, um, you know, it, it's certainly uh, your all's prerogative, however you're comfortable with this. Just some of the initial logic to putting that together. Uh, multifamily residential, uh, because of the um, uh, economics of it, we found that it's uh, a little less economical to do at three stories than if you go up to five. Um, I think there's some new town buildings that show this where they basically do the ground floor as a concrete structure that they include parking in, and then the stick built above it has kind of a limit of four stories uh, before you need to go to uh, concrete or steel construction. So that's why you see a lot of uh, multifamily nowadays at four or five stories. Um, it, it could certainly be lower, but I think one of the considerations both on the multifamily uh, height and on the overall density is uh, if you want to get affordable housing, uh, you, you want some kind of equation that is going to allow um, multifamily housing to be built uh, at higher densities or more economical. And then the last thing I would say is keep in mind these are net densities. So other than unlike the uh, allocation of land area uh, to you know um, residential or non-residential, when we talk about densities. Uh, there's a specific note in there that says these are net. So you would not be seeing this over the whole land area. You would be seeing it over a development pod that is residential or commercial, these kind of densities uh, as a net density. Okay, anybody else? Uh, one second. Um, Rich, you're back. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add to to Vlad's comment um, uh, about it does allow more opportunity um, for some affordable housing units. But I also um, want to say, in my mind, that this, you know, one of the one of the the key aspects of where we're going on this plan is to try to force more growth. Um, uh, more population density into the PSA. And this is part of the trade-off that we talked about during the discussions is that it might require um, greater height uh, limitations than we currently have and, and greater density. But, but to me, this is part of the, the trade-off to um, trying to force uh, the population inside the PSA and um, to... Um, uh, use use uh, existing facility, renovate existing facilities and, and that sort of thing. So uh, again, to me, it's it's a trade-off. Okay. Frank? 
I, I guess three or four four things is I, I'd feel a little bit more comfortable if we were a little bit more specific on level one and level two as to where we're talking about. I, I really don't have, and we'll probably have a discussion about this with level one in terms of the uh, Anderson Corner and Tohano. I think those intensities and densities are about right. But, but where I got a, a problem with is when we start talking about uh, Croker, uh, when we start talking about uh, Eastern State, uh, the Route 60, 143, and 199 interchanges, uh, Stonehouse, those sort of five-story densities would bother me in those more rural areas, but maybe not so much in the more urbanized. The, the other piece of that, when we talk about the trade-offs, is that uh, we're never going to make 199 from... Route 5 all the way out to the interstate traffic better. I mean, it, it's already horrible. It's going to get worse. So when we start talking about putting these densities along that corridor and the eastern state, it, it boggles my mind about how we're going to compound an already an existing problem. So for the traffic. On the issue of, of affordability, um, I understand Vlad's point uh, that you know you need to, to incentivize in some ways, but right now we don't have an HOP policy, and the uh, suggestion in the housing section is an inclusionary uh, housing policy, which which would would require that James City County uh, be uh, afforded the same uh, prerogative as Albemarle, uh, Loudoun County, and and several other places, or Charlottesville and Alexandria, which are not so. That's a number of years away. And so I, I, I want to make sure that if we're going to do something on the issue of affordable housing, that there is some way to be incentivized to be able to make that happen. And until we have that, I'm not comfortable about getting to five or six uh, in, in the medium uh, level two. I'm more comfortable with the office piece, maybe two to four, but not much higher than that. Uh, uh, for it. So, so that's where I kind of stand on this thing. And, and so when it comes down to it, back to my first point about talking about the, set, the individual areas, the, the language that is in the current po uh, comp plan for Barnesville and Anderson's Corner EO provides the staff the ability that if a developer comes in there and tries to do something that's out of whack with that language, staff gets to say no. I'm not sure we yet have that language for Croker interchange to include the notion that we're also going to look at that with in, in, with, in concert with the Hill Pleasant Farm EO so that we have a vision that is consistent between the mixed use in the Croker piece and the mixed use that's going to occur in the EO. And so I, I, I'm not comfortable yet that the staff has got the language that later down the road, they could say yes or no to something that comes in there. And the example that I have in mind is the one that Tom has in front of him right now for the Croker Interchange, where somebody wants to put an amusement park and a restaurant uh, next to that Mirror Lake uh, uh, quadrant of that. And he's very nicely said, it doesn't quite fit. Well, I'd like to make sure in the future, Tom has the right language in that Croker interchange and that Hill Pleasant EO that allows the right type of development based on the vision we've been talking about. And so I'm not sure that we want to end up with high density at that interchange at that level, period. Thank you. Uh, Vaughn and then Tim. Vaughn, do you have your hand up? I do, I just had to turn my, my um, microphone on. I just wanted to point out that when it comes to public private partnerships and their ability to get funding, um, the vehicle that's most popular right now is the low income housing tax credit. And when you look at um, building heights capped at four uh, and your densities, you're going to get more developers interested in your locality when they can see that they're not going to be constrained at that building height um, at four or below. And um, they're also going to be looking closely at what the uh, net densities are. 
I think if you look at what was proposed on the Marston property, that might be, um, I think that product is something that is the, the going rate in the market these days. I just wanna make you all aware of that from the affordable housing and the financing perspective. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim and then Jenny. Um, I, I'm not so much opposed, surprise, surprise, um, um, to two, five and, and six or maybe even taller buildings. And if I remember correctly, not this comp plan, but the comp plan before uh, the building, the local builders told us that um, economically, um, buildings below five stories are not as, as feasible as, as those buildings above five stories um, economically. So, you know, I, I am, however, in favor, as we looked at, at look at some of these mixed use parcels, you know, if we put the taller buildings to, to the rear, to the, to the middle or to the rear of the parcel, and it had buffers along the edges, um, you know, it, they don't become as visual, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, I, I actually like the development that's going in in the old Williamsburg Crossing Shopping Center, but I'm not a fan of the, the buildings that they put right on Monticello Avenue, right up on the roadway, because I don't think that's what, what folks in James City County want. So I do think there's a way to strike a medium um, position that says, you know, we'll allow it, but we're going to ask for proper buffers up front and it will lessen the, the, the visual impact of a building, the, the further it's removed from the road and the more that the, the, it's landscaped towards the front. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, that um, I was doing when I was trying to think about these five and six story buildings was looking at all the places that are designated as a possibly suburban center, like Norwich and Lightfoot and Williamsburg Crossing. And the thought of six stories, especially in some of those areas was really unappealing to me. Um, so I don't know whether others are in favor of not going to six stories or whether there's an opportunity to take away <clears throat> the suburban center designation in a couple of these places. Uh, anyway, I'll just throw that out there. Thank you. Uh, Ellen? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, again, just a, first of a, a clarification, I think uh, Ms. Wortman um, for Norge, um, I, I think that uh, that was one you just mentioned as uh, maybe something that it was a concern in your mind. That one would be the small town or suburban center and would match to level one. So if I'm looking at this right, I think the, the number of stories there, um, the greatest uh, would be up to three. Um, ah, okay, sorry, I, I misread the suburban center. That's, that's my fault, I apologize. Oh, no worries. Um, I was also going to mention, um, going back to uh, what Mr. Polster said, just uh, another reminder, and it is a bit convoluted, but uh, it's an effort to not repeat too much. Um, the mixed use designation, um, the mixed use development standards, you see actually on the screen there, number four, it has general language and then A, it talks about all developments should refer to the residential and commercial development standards, um, including affordable and workforce housing. When you look at the residential development standards, there's an item there that refers folks to the housing chapter guidance and anything that's in the ordinance. So I, I know I know things are changing with HOP and we'd like to look at changing them in our ordinance, um, but as, as a sort of baseline standard, um, if you all recall in the housing chapter, we do now have a statement um, that talks about what the county would like to see within development um, and it has the AMI uh, number there and a percentage uh, there. And um, now uh, folks going through a rezoning process are able to offer proffers. So just uh, just wanted to put that out there um, sort of as a 
a baseline piece on the affordable workforce housing. Thank you very much. Good point, thank you. Julie? Yes, um, can you hear me? Because I've been having trouble with my microphone. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, Tim's comment to me was very persuasive. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, at Williamsburg Crossing, where you have the medical building, which of course is just two stories, but still it's down a hill and around a corner and you can't see it from Route 5. So that if um, taller buildings can be appropriately buffered, I really don't think I would have a problem with them. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Jenny? I forgot to lower my hand, thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, just just back on on uh, Ellen's last uh, comment, and then to make a comment on 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 Jenny um, Jenny's comment. But uh, the the housing chapter right now uh, cites fifteen two two three zero four in one of your GSAs, which is the inclusionary housing thing, which requires a legislative change. And so that may be something that's down the road, but. Until you have something like that in place, you have nothing that's enforceable on a hop unless somebody comes in and offers something and you kind of feel okay about it or you accept it and why you accept it, I don't know, or how. But but right now we have no way uh, of doing that in a foreseeable way. So I'll just, I'll leave that one alone. But back to, to Jenny's question, I've got no problem with four for the mixed use level two. And I agree with Tim, if there is a way to buffer that so that it is like, uh, like uh, Julie just talked about. But in most cases, the real issue is the traffic impact on putting density levels of that nature there. And, and the Waysburg Crossing is a perfect example of that nightmare that exists from there through Jamestown all the way out. And so I, 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 if you increase the density, you are going to get more traffic on there. Thank you. Thanks. Ellen, uh, back to you. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. And apologies for, for not being more specific a moment ago. Um, the, the guidance I was uh, speaking uh, about in the housing chapter was, was uh, not actually within the GSAs, but I can't remember what page of the, the chapter text is, but one of the early pages, there's, there's a, a statement um, that talks about uh, what the county would like to see in new developments going forward. Um, so it's a, it's something that the working group, the planning commission and the board could refer to um, within the chapter text itself uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Rob? Yeah, uh, just a couple of follow-up comments based on the discussion here. And sorry to disagree with some folks. One, um, I agree that we should look for opportunities if developers are willing and it, it satisfies sort of building in higher density areas to look for taller buildings. I mean, it seems like planning 101 is a little bit built up, not out. So if you certainly want to protect rural lands. That's one way to accommodate that. And everything that I've heard about those new buildings on Monticello that sit on the road are people are generally happy with them. They have a really neat design and yeah, they don't fit into maybe a traditional look of Williamsburg, but I'm around people around there all the time because of being at William & Mary and people have, for the most part, said really positive things about how those look and what that's bringing to the area. It's sort of a, a newer look on development. And three, I, I still don't understand the traffic issue. I mean, and maybe it's because I, coming from New York City, traffic means something a little bit different, but I've been I'm back and forth by Williamsburg crossing all the time. And maybe I've had to wait for a light once or twice, but I, I don't, what is the big traffic issue there? I just don't see it. And, and if, if we constantly plan for reducing traffic and that's the main goal, you're never gonna, I don't think, accomplish anything else when it comes to planning. Accomplished anything else when it comes to what, uh, Rob? I missed that. The other ideas around development and planning. If mm -hmm. the whole goal is to make sure cars can get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, we'll never have a place that's accommodating to pedestrians or cyclists or public transportation if we constantly say, well, it's too much of a burden on traffic and people are going to have to wait a little longer to get through the light, so we better not do it. Thank you. Uh, Tim? 
I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify, you know, when I was talking about um, Williamsburg Shopping Center, uh, the only thing that I think we should consider, I actually like that development is just the, the frontage on the roadway. So when we're talking about, you know, protecting scenic views and, and having uh, some more open space, um, that's why I was suggesting that if we want to go that route, which I agree with, then we could ask for some setbacks so they're not right on on the roadway because then I do think it's a little, got a little incongruous of a look, um, you know, when you go from, from farmland to vertical, but if we set that verticality back, then, then to me, it works. Good, thank you, Frank. I mean, the last thing, and, and Rob has, has, has brought this up uh, in the past on the traffic. We hired a consultant team with an RFP that says we wanted you to take a look at the cumulative impact of growth of adding 120,000 people, and we want you to tell us what the traffic impact is. And we have a policy in the current comp plan that says the board says we don't want levels of service to go below C. And the roads that I'm talking about are currently E and F. So what we're talking about is adding another 40,000 people to that traffic commute on 199 and exasperates a problem that you have today. So if we want to repeat what happened on Monticello where we ended up not approving development because of that issue, then okay. But this is where you stop those problems. You're not going to fix the Jamestown 199 unless you build a bridge over it. So all the commuting traffic of about 19,000 folks a day that commute in and out use 199 to get to their homes. And what we're talking about are higher densities to accommodate that 40,000 additional folks above what we have. And that comp plan, and by putting more densities into those issues, compounds an already exasperated problem. And that's an issue today. But Frank, this is Tim. We're not talking about putting all 40,000 down on 199 adjacent to, to Newtown. We're talking about, you know, we've got mixed use um, at the 64 interchange at Toano and the 64 interchange at Croker and in Anderson's Corner. So I think it's disingenuous to say we're gonna put 40,000 people smack in the heart of James City County adjacent to Newtown on the 199 corridor. Cause that, that's fair, but this standard specifies those suburban areas along that corridor, all three intersections, Eastern State and Croker. And that's what the standard's going to apply to. Well, then I'm all for higher density at the Croker interchange and Anderson's Corner and the other way. So, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm with Rob. I, no, no, you're, 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 I don't have a problem about the Croker interchange. I really don't. Because it's isolated to 64, it doesn't do anything to the internal roads. And that would fit. But the other ones, no. We, and we don't have a problem with Croker at this point because we're going to put four lanes there and take care of that problem. Um, anybody else? Uh, is it, uh, I, I personally uh, am opposed to buildings above four floors. For one thing, I, I, I think, just think it's inconsistent with the image of James City County, um, but also, it just adds too many people and yes, more traffic. Um, uh, I, you know, you could probably <clears throat> get a higher density in Tawana with 227, <clears throat> pardon me, in Croker. Anderson's Corner, I've already bored everybody with my views on that, but um, that's too close to the other two uh, to put high density. Um, but in, in uh, for level two, uh, I would 
residential density, uh, they're proposed there is six to 12 units per acre. I think four to eight units is plenty. <clears throat> and I would cap the floors at four. Um, no, anyway, that's how I feel about it. But let's, I think we've beaten this subject to death. Um, do you want to take a straw vote on moving this forward as written or make a change or how does everybody want to proceed? How, how about a, I'll, I'll make a motion to move this forward as written. All in favor? Aye. That three? I heard, I heard, I heard Julie Rich. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Aye. Aye. Rob is three. Tim? Yeah, I'm still sitting on the fence. <clears throat> Barbara. Oh, Barbara. Okay, you're aye, Barbara? Yes, sir. So that's four. Going once. Going twice. Jack, I think I'll just sort of be a no on this one. Okay. I'm, I'm a no also. Uh, Frank, I gather you're a no? Yes. Willing to compromise on Kroger, but if it comes down to the vote, no. And Jenny? No. Okay, so it's four to four. Um, we have to find something else if we uh, we can't Has move Julie, it forward. Julie voted. Pardon? Julie voted. Yeah, Julie's Julie was an I. Julie, did I get you right? I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, I thought I heard. You. Uh, um, we can't move it forward on a four to four vote. I gather. Um, uh, how about a, um, Jack, could we sort it out by targeting, for example, not Williamsburg crossing, but yes, for the I-64 interchanges areas? Uh, we haven't gotten down to the, the specific areas yet. Um, there's, there's descriptions on all, yeah, on all of them. But I mean, that seemed to be some of the, the sticky points that we had was the traffic. I think I think the suggestion is a good one because it's how you apply level two. Mm -hmm. and, and the way this level two is described with that suburban piece, it wouldn't apply to a Norge, but it would apply to those ones that are designated medium town or suburban centers, which are the eastern state, the interchanges, uh, the croaker, and I guess that was it. Stonehouse. Oh, Stonehouse, right. Exactly. So those are the ones that level two would apply to based on this standard. Okay, so. So I'm, I'm sorry. So Jack, I, I need to, to go backwards. So I, I understood. So if we're going to talk about descriptions later, then I'm in favor of the way this is. And just want to dig into the descriptions more as we get there. So okay. I apologize. So no, no that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm misunderstood. So I would vote aye for this. Okay, so it's five to three to move this part of it uh, before we get to the specific mixed use areas. Um, so let's do that. Let's. So this this. Oh, Alan. Um. I, just to put this out there, um, I, I don't know if there's a pro con approach to this, but uh, we will be bringing the designation descriptions back to you all one more time with those other edits that Mr. Wysong mentioned. Um, if there was some changes to how you would like the different areas classified, potentially it could be done at that time, but we're certainly glad to um, go through that today as well, whichever the working group would prefer. Well, we could certainly talk about that. Um, had you not intended to, to speak to the specific areas? Mr. Um, Weissel or, or Alan, either one? Well, sure, thanks for the question. The, um, the specific areas, we've included the UDA place types as a reference to level one and to level two. And so that's sort of the, the tie in there so really, the discussion we've had so far has been really, really helpful, really clarifying, and ultimately what gets decided for level one and level two um, 
would end up influencing those individual um, areas. It wouldn't override everything that's written there, certainly not the case, um, but they are tightly connected. And the other thing I wanted to mention just on the density piece, John, if you wouldn't mind scrolling up a little bit, we do have a paragraph that's included um, where we, I think we even say specifically that we don't recommend a higher density unless significant public benefits such as affordable housing, enhanced environmental protection, and a high degree of access to multimodal transit transportation or civic or recreational amenities is included. So a definitely great discussion about the density, but I, I did want to put that out there that we wanted to make sure that language was included so point. that it would, really, it would really be on the applicant to prove if they're trying to do a higher density, that that's an application that includes a significant public benefit. So it certainly wouldn't be a done deal. Um, just wanted to put that out there because that is language that would empower the planning commission and the county uh, to expect a higher quality proposal on those issues. Thank you. Jenny? Um, John, would that, uh, what you just referred to, how would that affect um, six-story office buildings, if at all? So let me let me see if I'm I'm following your question here. Are you saying if we got a proposal and somebody had a six-story building, let's say it's yeah. a level two? Yes. Uh, as written, I don't think. And, and Ellen, please weigh in if this is the case. I don't. I think the standards as written would let you do a six-story building for an office building. Um, that would be part of the broader rezoning package that would come in that would still be tied into density. But I think it's broken out within the table where the unit density is separate from the number of stories, although one would inform the other for residential development. Yeah, well, so, so where I'm going with this is that the paragraph you mentioned about public benefits really wouldn't have any bearing on somebody building a six-story office building if it's permitted in a level two area, right? Uh, yeah, it would, it would not directly address that use being proposed. That's a good point. It probably that use would be packaged in with a residential component, but yes, no, that's a, that's a good observation. So, so if we approve these um, level two standards, as they are written, we are approving six-story office buildings in all these places that are designated as um, medium town or suburban center, right? Well, you'd be approving it as the range for a future legislative case. Um, the county would certainly still have the option to weigh the entire proposal and determine whether or not it was a good fit based on uh, that all of the factors that are that are listed there. So yes, to answer your question, that would be the permitted standard for a legislative case, but with the mixed use intention, there would certainly be a residential component and staff would look at all of those factors. And obviously the planning commission would do that as well. And certainly the board to make the decision. Thank you. So I'm sorry to jump in. But Ginny raises a really interesting point, at least in my mind. Um, you know, do we even care what the building is? So, you know, we're talking about here, you know, multifamily residential two to five stories, office two to six. And really, in, if we follow something like we see in, in Newtown and some of these other urban centers where they're doing, you know, retail, then office, and then residential, um, you know, I mean, would we just be better off saying that we would consider, you know, you know, I, I hesitate to throw out a number, but, you know, maybe five to eight stories as a max, if it, if it combined those uses and therefore limited, um, you know, the it created less impervious surface, you know, by going more vertical. I mean, that's, I think, one of the benefits that, that we're missing out when, in this discussion, too, is, you know, the more vertical we are, the, the less we're 
we're impacting the the impervious cover. So um, I guess at the end of the day, you know, if somebody built an office building that was six stories and couldn't fill it and wanted to convert it to apartments or condominiums, you know, does it really matter? And in, in our minds, we're just looking at the 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 land use and and you know the outside. I mean, do we care what's on the inside as much? Frank, you, I think you're muted, Frank. Just had a question for Tom. If you use the standard for six stories or eight stories or whatever, does that mean that there is a change in the zoning ordinance for heights of buildings? Well, the good question. The zoning district would control whatever proposed development would come in. And so I'm sure we would look at whatever is adopted within the comprehensive plan to see what inconsistencies might be there. But um, certainly, uh, uh, if the zoning district caps the height, the comp plan doesn't let you get out of that. You're still governed by the zoning district. And so how does that apply to these six areas? Well, so in, in a legislative case, if the proposal was to rezone the property to mixed use, whatever the height restriction within the zoning ordinances would apply. And um, the county, if this were adopted, for example, the county would look at the zoning ordinance to see if there are any, you know, conflicts between the two. Um, and I don't know if anybody on staff then knows what the height restriction is for mixed use in the zoning district off the top of their head. I, I don't have it right in front of me. Um, but, you know, the zoning would apply, and this would be the guide for legislative cases and future development. Not sure if that exactly gets at your question, so feel free to reiterate or reword if I'm, if I'm missing it. Well, it may make the six or eight a moot question for Croker as an example, or for any of the other interchanges or Eastern State or Stonehouse. And I would think it would apply to Stonehouse given that they're master planned. So maybe if it's I could cool. but, um, I see Mr. Holt's hand up. No, I'm just going to defer to Ellen. Okay, Ellen. Oh, just a, a brief note. Um, as as you all probably already know, following a comprehensive plan, there's typically a process of looking sort of comprehensively at the zoning ordinance, and as Thomas uh, alluded to a moment ago, um, looking at where there were changes in the comprehensive plan. Um, where we may need to realign ordinances to to uh, make some changes, um, and that's not just for for building height, but um, any number of things. So just to add that, thank you. Now, and and so I can I can uh, add into that earlier question specifically. Right now, the height limit in the mixed use district is 60 feet. That's going to equate to about five stories. So I don't know that it makes the question before you moot. Um, because again, as Ellen said, this is the policy basis when we go in and revise the EO district. When we go in and revise the mixed use district, we will look to the comp plan for the policy basis about what those revisions should be. You're not automatically tied to it. When you go in and review the ordinance, you could decide to do something entirely different. Again, this document is just the policy basis. But if somebody were to walk in this walk in today, with the application for something in mixed use, they could do up to five stories. That's what the ordinance allows today. You couldn't do any more than that. Somebody walked in and wanted to do something taller than 60 feet. The ordinance doesn't currently allow for that. Putting that language in this comp plan, as Thomas said earlier, doesn't change that. You're still capped at the 60 feet or about the five stories. Um, but you know that's really a consistent uh, for mixed use and the non-residential um, 60 feet is pretty consistent for, for what's across the entirety of the county and what's been in the ordinance for a long, long time. When you get into the purely residential districts, you get down to like 35 feet, which is like three stories. So, you know, just to kind of help round out that discussion about what some of our baselines are currently. Thank you very much. Rich, you've been very patient. 
Oh, that's thank you, Jack. Uh, no, and I, I want to just echo a couple of the comments that were made. And I, you know, one is a repetition uh, of what I've been saying is if it's important to preserve open spaces and have l uh, less density in the rural lands, there's got to be trade offs somewhere. And, you know, and this is where we want to force um, density uh, into the PSA. And one of the ways to accommodate that is to look at height waivers. But I think to Thomas's and Tim's and a couple other points, you know, this is where um, you can you can look at, at, at an application that comes in at the high end and say, well, wait, you know, similar to many legislative cases, what are the, what are you, the developer offering? Um, uh, are you going to, um, set this building back far to Tim's point farther away and buffer it, for instance, so it's less obtrusive? Is it going to be close to multimodal transportation that'll reduce the traffic impacts and, and, and so on and so forth? And this is all how, you know, we, what, we, what we do with every legislative case that comes before us. We weigh, you know, the comp plan as well as the, the benefits and risks to the, to the community. And, and, and it is, after every comp plan is approved, the policy committee's uh, workload, a very significant portion of that is, is to look at rewording some of the ordinances that, that may be in conflict with the comp plan. But this is a long-winded version to say, you know, I, I think that we need to be willing to accept uh, some additional height and some additional density uh, in order to meet the objectives that we set out for ourselves on this comp plan. Ellen? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, this, uh, just to uh, make a suggestion for the working group's consideration, if there was a sort of a majority of folks who were comfortable with the, you know, the first three sections there, one uh, with the recommended density and um, the other two above that, um, you know, there, the, the way that the different mixed use areas are labeled off to the side, um, comes from um, a state level document. So that, those are what our UDAs are termed um, in the VTRANS document. But for our comprehensive plan purposes, I think we, we would have the ability to change some of them from one thing to another. Um, and there, there'd probably be some feedback loop way to then update that at the state level. Um, we can look into that more. So it, it could be a consideration to um, have the language as shown and then make adjustments um, when we bring back the DDDS uh, to you all and are looking uh, again at each of the mixed use areas um, uh, for some adjustments that you'd already asked for um, at that time. If there's some, some of them that you would like to consider changing from say rural or village center classification to a medium town center or whatever it would be, um, probably, uh, could be an opportunity to do that at that time. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have we've agreed by five to three to to move forward on the first three sections, as Ellen stated. So let's let's just go from here. And uh, back to you, Mr. Weisson. Great. Well, the uh, the last thing that I had to go through for land use was just the um, the designation development concepts. I don't believe we had any emails from members of the working group about this, but I did want to just take a chance to have them up on the screen and see if there was any general feedback from the working group on you know, this approach to showing the development concept for the designations. Hearing none? Thank you. Um, good, good job. Um, so we're off to economic development. Am I right about that? Don't go away, Mr. Weissong. <laughs> well, you know, I think I think Ms. Costello will be doing this one. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to say. I'll turn it over to her. Terry, Terry, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Costello, and Thomas and I will be presenting the economic development section. Next slide. The items for review today will be the revisions to the technical report, the update to the community guidance document, and revisions to the goals, strategies, and actions. Next slide. 
Revisions to the technical report included language that references the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to diversify the county's economic base, language that encourages the county to monitor changes in the minimum wage that may affect county businesses and employees, Languages, language that encourages the county to monitor the increase in on online retail sales versus sales from storefront businesses and how it may impact the overall economy. We added a section explaining public-private partnerships and how they are used to expand the county's economic base. And we also added the term foreign trade zone to the glossary. Next slide. The community guidance document has been updated to include the third round of community input. Respondents to the policies and actions questionnaire were asked for opinions on steps the county might take to implement citizens' vision for the future. The results included consistent public support to diversify the local economy with a focus on development of higher wage employment, mix support for the county investing in infrastructure to serve economic sites within the PSA, and there was a preference for more mixed use centers for development of completed communities that can support future economic growth. Respondents to the community character design guidelines questionnaire were asked for views on the appearance of structures that might be built in the future and the surrounding lands. The results included neighborhood anchors, integrated shops, and community hubs were rated positive, positively. Corporate styles were generally rejected. Comments included how neighborhood anchors foster community interactions and encourage tourism. Outdoor dining and reusing older buildings is a community benefit. And other positive ratings included noted walkability, ease of access, and aesthetics, and community character. Next slide. With regards to the goal strategies and actions, changes were made to the goal based on the PCWG feedback. Feedback was also received from the consultants on the revised goal, and both versions were included for review. The CPACE program has been added as an action item and an action to analyze the experiences of the last year during the, during the COVID-19 pandemic has been added. Next slide. The revised goal based on PCWG input is to build a more sustainable local economy with a diversity of clean businesses and professions that attracts higher paying jobs, investment opportunities, supports the growth of the county's historic agritourism and ecotourism sectors, contributes positively to the community's quality of life, and upholds James City County's commitment to community character. The goal, which included the input from the consultants, is to build a more sustainable local economy that upholds James City County's commitment to community character and environmental protections results in a diversity of businesses, community investment, and professions that attract higher paying jobs, supports the growth of the county's historic agritourism and ecotourism sections, contributes positively to the community's quality of life, and better balances the local tax base. Next slide. And then we look forward to your questions or comments. Tim, first up. Um, thanks, Terry. Just a quick question. We talk in there about supporting historic agro and eco tourism. Um, for a while there, we were promoting sports tourism and the like. Has that gone by the wayside or are we keeping it, minimizing it? Um, or do we need to call it out more specifically? Well, there is, um, there's 6.4 and 6.5 that talk about sporting events. 
as a sports tourism destination. Sporting support tourism initiatives that, purport, that promote the historic triangle. I think, there we go, 6.4. Unless you wanted something more specific. No, I just in I'm just asking the question because you're in your descriptors. It talked about promoting those, um, you know, and I'm currently up in Chesterfield County, and you know, they the the county acquired a a pretty significant um, sports complex here a number of years ago that brings in. Um, they, they estimate about ninety million dollars a year to the local economy, and and so they're they're building a a whole not, or there's plans to build a whole nother retail entertainment piece next to it. So um, I just I get so one feeds the other, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So it was just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose sight of of sports. And so I'm good. Thanks. There was a comment, we did get some comments um, from the group, and someone did make a comment about blanket support for the development of sports facilities. So I don't know if that's an overall consensus with the group, or I was looking for any kind of feedback from that, unless we just want to keep this in there. I think 6.5 says it very well. Um... Or, excuse me, 6.4. Okay. Well, I guess my question then, Jack, is, you know, should we lose potential facilities? And and I only say this because, you know, uh, Doug Ponds in the city has has been floating the idea of, of taking the, the visitor center area and promoting that as a, as a sports destination facility, you know, and we're, we're going to continue to um, compete with across the region, if it's Williamsburg or Virginia Beach or, or Richmond um, for some of these, these tournaments and um, college showcase type things. So, um, you know, I don't know that we, we capture it all with, with WISC um at the at the warhills sports complex so i'm um, not sure if we need to make it more emphatic than than support and potential um, would you care to reward that um i just i i was hoping to get other people's feedback um you know i because i i do i do think it's probably more, um, there are more uh, powerful words like create or explore or, or maybe not so much explore, but um, find opportunities or those types of things. So I would just be curious to hear what others have to say. Advance, advance the development of sporting events and potential facilities. Uh, potential facilities to me is something like Doug Pons is talking about. Um, uh, it's not very specific, of course, but you, or, or you could get specific. Uh, do we need a basketball? Or, we already have a pretty good football and, and soccer and baseball facilities, I think, or maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe we need more of those too, but, um, you know, could, would we, um, should that should six point four be more specific? <clears throat> Advance the development of potential facilities such as a, a, a basketball arena, or you know, that would also accommodate volleyball and wrestling and things like that. Or is is that where you is that where you're headed? Um. I mean, personally, I think so. I, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. I'm, I'm not one. I I don't know. Um, you know, and I and I guess this is where 
we look to the EDA for input or guidance or, or help. I, you know, I don't know the adequacy of our facilities, you know, but mm -hmm. when I look at, um, you know, certainly the, the college has the, the colonial relays and, um, you know, they, they can handle that capacity, you know, from a spectator piece, but, you know, we, we don't have a facility like Boo Williams where you can have, you know, 16 basketball games going on at one time. Um, you know, true. I don't, I don't know that our, our schools, you know, I just hear this anecdotally through Parks and Rec, but, you, you know, while we're supposed to have this cross-pollination between schools and Parks and Rec, I, I think the schools are pretty protective of, of their facilities and their schedules and their availabilities for those types of things. So, um, you know, when we, to me, when we say things like potential, it just says, okay, we'll take a wait and see attitude and, you know, okay, how about, you, you, that's a good point, take out potential. Support the development of sporting events and facilities. I, I'm that, fine, with, I'm that fine with that. I, I'm just one voice. That's why I was curious what, what others had to say because I, I do think to, to our other conversation before, you know, we, we have some great places um, that are close to 64 that could you know, bring people in, not come into, uh, you know, not bring day traffic into the, into the county so much, um, but bring, bring all that other, um, um, all that other traffic in. And if it's overnight traffic could populate our hotels. And, and if we put them close to the 64 interchanges, then um, it, it's sort of a win-win in, in my mind, so. Okay. Frank, you um, want to weigh in on this? Well, I just wanted to, to, to comment that when I was looking at the current budget that we have, and I was looking at the operational initiatives that are supposed to link back to the comp plan here, uh, John Carnifax had one on this point about uh, sports facilities uh, and doing that. And I don't know that they're connected. And if it isn't the ED, is it the rec park people that ought to be standing up for this. So in support of, of Tim, I, I think there ought to be something programmatic that, that causes either the ED or the Rex guys to do something, an action. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jenny? Uh, thank you. Uh, two things. Um, I'm, I'm the one that threw the bucket of cold water on this one that uh, Terry mentioned. And the reason is that, and, and I can't give the specific examples right now, but um, I just wanted to ensure that, and maybe this is too fine a point to include here, but that there is some economic feasibility study done before um, there's a kind of a blanket endorsement of the development of facilities that may or may not yield 90 million dollars as is the case in Chesterfield. So that's point one. Um, the second point was that um, I very much, um, I, I, with regard to the goal, I spent a few minutes wondering what a clean profession was. And then I decided that I really liked the consultants re rewrite better. Um, but I think where it says sections, it ought to say sectors. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, Terry, and then you, Rich. Okay. I just want to mention, and, and I could be wrong, but I am, I am pretty confident that Parks and Rec do have a dedicated position that deals with the sports tourism avenue. So I think they are already doing something um as far as being involved or trying to recruit i'm not sure exactly what it is but i i'm pretty sure there's a dedicated position for that so terry when you say dedicated position do you mean in the comp plan or in their in their program in their parks and rec already they have a person that that handles the sports 
and, and the tournaments and stuff like that. I am pretty sure they have a dedicated person that, that is involved somehow with that okay. already. When we were talking about, when Mr. Polster mentioned either economic development or parks and rec, I think parks and rec is already involved in some capacity. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Um, thank you, Jack. Um, I, first of all, I, I uh, echo Ginny's sentiments that as far as the economic development goal, I do like uh, the rewrite recommended by the consultants. Uh, I think that 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 reads better. Uh, Jack, I agree with your uh, suggestion on um, 6.4 to just eliminate potential, say, sporting events and facilities, and also say that um, you know this wouldn't preclude uh, a, a regional sporting partnership in a sense that if. If, for example, a stadium goes in um, uh, with a, uh, the city of Williamsburg, then maybe we put an aquatic, we meaning James City County, put an aquatic center in. And, and so you could have, um, you know, high-end sporting events uh, for specific sports in, you know, your county, Williamsburg and James City County that might bring about a, 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 a better partnership. But I just wanted to say that I, even though we're saying the county, that wouldn't preclude uh, partnerships to, to look at the broader sports venue opportunities. Terry, um, do, you, do, you, do you need from us guidance on the, the goal, which, which of the two goals, and then uh, guidance on all of the, um, strategies and actions is that what you're looking for tonight right we want to we want to um approve the goal or, or how we are getting general consensus for the goal okay and then, um, you know we also received all the the different comments back which a lot of them were um like at a small editorial which we made the majority of them uh -huh. so if we can just get um, and okay for all the changes that were emailed. And then there's a couple sections where we wanted the group's input on. Okay. Um, the, um, with regard to 6.4, is everybody okay with, with it as written except strike the word potential? Yes, sir. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, um, and what's the sense on which of the two goals? I, I favor uh, goal number two. Um, yeah, actually, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I like number two just because it has the local tax base. They're very similar other than that. But um, uh, anybody else want to weigh in on that? You're referring to the economic development goal with the yep. consultant rewrite, Jack. Is that yeah, right? there, there are yeah. two yeah. here that we can choose among. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Jenny and I both prefer, I, I think Jenny, I heard you say you prefer number two also. As well, I do too, Jack. And this is Julie, I do too. Okay, anybody else? Uh, okay, so it, I, I think it sounds unanimous, favor number two. Uh, unanimous change 6.4 to, to strike potential. Everybody else is okay on the whole rest of of goal strategies and actions for economic development? I've got one on the a rewrite for 4.8 that I okay. sent to Terry already. Right. And this one, 4.8 just says consider adopting uh, a program. And what I had put in there was that the adopt a commercial program, the CPACE ordinance, because you need an ordinance to be able to do this. And it does two things. It establishes a county clean energy financing program that funds improvements for resiliency and stormwater management. And, and the emphasis that I'm putting on, on the ordinance and those two programs is that $80 million that I talked about out of the RGGI, there's a large chunk of it that's going to go to programs like this. And so this is a way for us to fix Chickahominy Haven uh, and some of the other stormwater problems uh, that we have for resiliency that we're going to have. So if we can get an ordinance in place, then we can take advantage of that grant funding to solve these problems. Okay. 
we, we were going to make, um, Mr. Polster, we were going to make the changes that you sent to us. Um, and then Mr. Haldeman had a couple that I believe he sent to us today. Well, they, they were just, they were just typos and stuff. Yeah, that's, we, we, we were going to do those. And then um, Ms. Wortman's list, we just had a couple that we weren't sure or, or we wanted to, to give feedback to. Um, for ED8, there was a the question, does the staff have any explanation for the county's relatively high rate of poverty for married coupled households? Um, we don't have that information readily available um, to be able to answer that. And there was another question um, for ED10 about uh, explaining why York and Williamsburg had significantly high growth in taxable sales. And that's due to the same reason. We just don't have um, the sources readily available for us to be able to explain why. Um, the third Carrie, comment was, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Just for folks following along, I think Terry's referring to the page numbers within the chapter text. So ED oh, sorry, page yes. eight and <laughs> ED page 10. Uh, rather than the GSA, so just... Uh, yes, this is with the chapter text. Sorry about that. Um, and let's see. And then as far as the GSAs with regards to um, ED1, we were going to reword that. Um, it's a ED 2.3 is garbled. We will definitely fix that. We kind of missed a word in there. And then we will omit 4.3. And then we made all the other minor corrections to the text and the GSAs. And if I could, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt there. John, if you wouldn't mind scrolling up to 4.3. I just wanted to point out, this is the one the working group had recommended be taken out and put in as a land use GSA. This is the one that was a bit unclear about, um, you know, planning certain areas. And so that is one that's coming out of the economic development section, but it's been reworded and will be worked into the uh, into the land use GSAs that, that facilitate the development of sub area master plans um, will be transferred over to the land use section. Thank you, Jenny. For, for your recommendation. Yeah, my question was um, whether um, on 4.3 and 4.4 .4 is that um, Croker Interchange is covered in both, and I didn't know whether that was needed. Is, is Croker Interchange adequately covered in 4.3 that you can take it out of 4.4? Because um, they don't, it doesn't seem to add anything to. It, it seems a bit overlapping is where I'm going with that. Oh, I, I see what you mean. And uh, Ellen, please feel free to, to disagree if I'm off here, but I think both of those are being considered to be taken out and then the land use GSA would, uh, would cover the intent for both of those. But That's Ellen, right. let me check in you. And is that my memory correct there? Yeah, yeah, it was our understanding both 4.3 and 4.4 were something that working group was comfortable moving to, to uh, the land use chapter and it is a bit more generalized in the land use chapter um, talking about strategic areas and then there's a little more detail to that but there's not that kind of direct repeat of croker interchange um, in the, the land use gsa new language okay the reason i got confused is at the very end of the chapter where you where there's a clear without the strikeout those two are still there. If you yeah. keep scrolling oh. down to the end. We inadvertently uh, left those in, but they, they would come out of the ED GSAs going forward. Okay, then that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on economic development? So we're moving it forward with those two, uh, four, three and four, four being moved to land use, uh, goal number two being accepted and, um, and the other one on sports development. And we'll, uh, Terry, do you need anything further from us? 
Just everybody's okay on it. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Uh, environment, <clears throat> Mr. Meadows. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, well, I am Brett Meadows. Uh, I'm one of the planners with Community Development Department. And with me tonight is Tori Haynes, also a planner. And I believe Tony Small, director of Stormwater Division, uh, is in attendance tonight. Uh, next slide, please. Items for discussion this evening include revisions to the technical, technical report, uh, the re results from the third round of community engagement, and revisions to the goals, strategies, and actions. Next slide, please. Revisions to the technical report include grammatical changes, um, an expansion of the ecosystem services section to incorporate and include green infrastructure, definitions and themes, a reorganiza reorganization of the shorelines section to consolidate themes and information, the addition of an open space preservation section and an update to language in the recreational and commercial fisheries section uh, that comes as a re request from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. Next slide, please. Uh, community guidance from the third round of community engagement comes predominantly from the policies and actions questionnaire. Um, prioritizing the protection of natural lands and open spaces was the most highly ranked and supported objective across all three rounds of engagement, including this one. Uh, respondents supported new development restrictions and public land acquisition to limit development impacts on natural lands and to address impacts of climate change and sea level rise with a strong focus on protecting water resources. Respondents also had strong support for protecting a wide variety of natural lands. Next slide, please. Goal strategies and actions change is included, have included uh, grammatical and other editorial suggestions. Some highlighted changes include um, nesting uh, 4.12 uh, under 1.21 as, as they're both related to interagency climate change uh, related GSAs. Um, a new GSA 1.23 was a suggestion. Um, and then 4.3 has been modified more to emphasize reduction in auto-dependent travel um, and to really capture tools to reduce auto-dependency rather than specifically, uh, it took out specifically prescribing density bonuses. Next slide, please. Uh, just as a reminder of the environment goal that um, this is after review from the prior round, uh, continue to improve the high level of environmental quality in James City County and protect rural and sensitive lands and waterways that support the resiliency of our natural systems for the benefit of current and future generations. Next slide, please. So that, that concludes our presentation portion of the discussion um, before we open it up to uh, comments and further discussion. Um, wanted to say this is our, uh, this is the last meeting where the environment chapter will be discussed individually. So we're hoping to receive affirmation for suggested changes. Um, and at this point, I'll turn it over to discussion. Great, thank you. Um, sorry. Go ahead, uh, Ellen. Brett, I don't know if you'd like to uh, go ahead and, and um, check with the working group about the editorial comments and then the specific items, um, if that was okay with the working group. If, if, they're, if they're just things like typos and that sort of thing, we don't, I don't think we need to see them if they're, if they're substantive. I actually have a couple that I should have sent last week and I didn't, and, but uh, Mr. Meadows, do you, do you wanna review some of the changes? 
Sure, yes, thank you. So um, most, of, most of the edits to the text and the GSAs were editorial in nature, and we've been able to incorporate them. Um, we'll, uh, Mr. Pulser sent in a few today. We haven't had as much time to review those, but we are working to um, incorporate those and can follow up with any uh, questions. Um, Let's see. The, I believe nothing. Nothing was substantial um, for this section, so I, I think uh, we can we can move forward. Right, uh, Frank. I, I did have something that I think is is substantive, and, and I don't know if, it, if the environmental section is the right one, even though it contains a lot of those uh, components of it, and and, and that is this. Um, uh, issue of resiliency planning. And throughout this uh, uh, comp plan update in the GSAs, uh, there has been uh, pieces of that resiliency plan that would be required by the state in terms of getting access to some of these funds that we're talking about. And, and so I think in, in some ways we've, we've gotten the green space slash open space pretty well covered in terms of, of what we want to do, where we want to protect, and how we want to do it. We clearly have within this environmental section uh, covered the protection of water, uh, the, just the notion of how we use the stormwater assistance fund to be able to <clears throat> get those. We, we've uh, added the CPACE piece, which, which allows us to access those fundings for resiliency uh, for it. And, and of course, we've got the shoreline piece that, that's in there. But, but there's nothing that connects all of those elements with the other strategies for sea level rise and trans, transportation vulnerability that we have that says this is the county plan for how the county wants to be resilient to sea level rise. We have component pieces of those articulated very well. But there's nothing that says, like the emergency management plan that the county has underneath an emergency management director, we, and those things are shared by the resiliency plan. We don't have a resiliency plan that pulls all of these pieces together. And, and so I'd like the staff to, to think about pulling those components together in the same way that you pulled the open space, green space thing across the different chapters. Uh, so that, in fact, the action that I'm looking for is the development of a county resiliency plan. And of course, the point of it is it then allows us to be able to access those funds that are going to be available to solve those problems uh, for it. And, and that's all I've got, Jack. Thank you. Um, um, Brett, was that clear to you? Um, is that something you can work with? Yes, uh, staff can take that into consideration. So just so I understand it, it sounds like um, pretty pretty similar to the open space uh, concept that's open space plan that goes across chapters. Um, we're looking for something to sort of unite that under a resiliency banner. Um, OK, good. With the, with the proviso that it, at some point you develop a resilient plan with those components. So for example, the transportation vulnerability where we've identified where those road networks are that we need to rebuild or put a bridge across at Jamestown. So we take all the component elements and say, we're gonna develop a plan across those GSA actions in those chapters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple. They're, they're not monumental, but and I'm sorry for not getting them to you last week. But in the environmental chapter on page 17, um, I'd like to add two words to the first paragraph. Um, the first sentence reads: Research by the Center for Watershed Protection has revealed a strong relationship. Blah blah blah. I'd like to add the word negative relationship um, because it is a negative relationship. And um, the same with the last sentence. Research always su also suggests a link between impervious cover and the diversity, richness, and abundance of aquatic life 
I'd like to stick negative in there, also suggests a negative link between impervious cover and the diversity, richness, so, so forth. Um, and the other one is a very minor thing. It's cosmetic, but uh, environment one, uh, GSA 1.2, Promote the use of better site design, low impact development, and effective best management practices, BMPs, period. Promote these techniques by, I would, I would just take up promote these techniques and you would have just one sentence. A minor thing, but, uh, and that's it for me. Anybody else? Um, Jack, would you, uh, instead of negative, uh, would adverse still convey that the, the, the term negative on the two sentences that you suggested seemed to be a little cumbersome, but it, an um, adverse relationship? I was thinking of a negative correlation, you know. Negative correlation. Okay. Okay. It, it, right. that's, that's, that's where I got the, it, it is a, they're correlated or they're related. And a negative correlation or negative, the term negative always goes with cor positive okay. or negative correlation. Okay. That's where I got it, but. Yeah. I, no, no, that, that, that makes sense now hearing that explanation. Thanks for clarifying. Sure. I agree with you. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh -huh. Anybody else? So it's the sense of the working group that we, we can advance um, the environmental section basically in its entirety with, with some of the um, editorial comments and so forth already already discussed or sent earlier. Uh, is that where we are? All right. Uh, that's certainly how I feel about it. Any, anybody opposed to that? Nope. Okay, Brett, you, I, I think you have it. Okay, thank you. Fair enough, good evening. And last but not least, Mr. Reisinger, you've been very patient. Or, or Mr. Meadows, you're still, you may still be there. Housing, uh, the housing chapter. I, I will return right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so good evening again. Uh, this is still Brett Meadows. Um, I am still with the Community Development Department. With me is John Reisinger, also a planner in that department. I believe uh, Von Poller. Uh, administrator of the neighborhood development might be on the call as well. Hanging on for your life, right, Vaughn? <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, items for discussion this afternoon include revisions to the technical report, uh, results from the third round of community engagement, and revisions to the goal strategies and actions. Next slide, please. Revisions to the technical report include grammatical changes, um, as well as uh, changing AMI from 100% to 80%, 80%, especially in reference to offering incentives, um, as well as uh, including target AMI range defined. Uh, with, there's a definition of that earlier in the text. Um, and then finally, the term workforce housing is now encompasses the terms workforce housing and affordable housing, and that is made clearer uh, early in the text. Next slide, please. Community guidance uh, from the third round of community engagement uh, from the planning or from the policies and actions questionnaire. Uh, so support for prioritizing resources to support affordable housing was lower compared to other public input priorities. Respondents identified adaptive reuse and redevelopment of existing commercial and employment locations and transit corridors as the best locations for new affordable workforce housing. Strategies to improve homes in existing residential neighborhoods and stabilize and enhance mobile home parks were also strongly supported. Next slide, please. And the goal strategies and actions, changes were made to the goal based on planning commission and working group feedback. Um, other notable uh, GSAs include uh, 
regarding uh, potential mandatory inclusionary zoning program. Uh, this has been clarified to encompass, encompass uh, the different provisions under the state code. Um, H2.2 was modified to focus on increased housing choice for households within a specific income rather than encompassing all market rate housing. And then uh, GSAs were reviewed based on prior comments to determine uh, where consolidation would be appropriate. Next slide, please. Uh, the housing goal as revised is con consistent with the four principles of the Workforce Housing Task Force, maintain and develop residential neighborhoods to achieve high quality design and construction and provide a wide range of choices for both renters and owners in housing types, densities, price ranges, and accessibility that address the needs of the county's residents and workers of all ages and income levels. Next slide, please. Any, uh, so uh, at, at this stage, and uh, um, Mr. Um, this time I do have a, as opposed to environment, there are a couple of uh, goals or uh, comments that that might be useful in um, in addressing. Uh, so whether that's now or in a moment. No, no now um, the, the, we do. go for it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so there was, um, thank you for the, thank you for comments. I, um, I believe, I believe they were all from Ms. Workman. Um, so if anyone else submitted comments, um, the, those are the ones that hit my inbox. So please let us know if you, you also have them. But there was a, uh, in H2.3.10, there was a question about um, interp interpreting permitting versus allowing. Um, so we're reworking that so that it, it's focused on uh, the permitting procedure rather than the allowing of something. So we'll uh, work on that. H4.4.1.1. A comment about the wording being a bit awkward, and so we're working on uh, wording that will uh, combine the, the idea of an income threshold. Uh, so establish an income threshold not exceeding eighty percent of AMI necessary for a project to qualify for an expedited review. As the, as the language we're currently working on, but we're, we're going to tweak that. And then, uh, let's see, I believe there was one more. And the last one was a comment on 4.2.1, uh, just uh, um, with a suggestion to add uh, leasing or purchasing um, as well as leasing. And our understanding of that GSA, which comes from a specific workforce housing task force, is that it that one is focused on uh, focused around rent, and um, and so our suggestion is to uh, maintain it being focused on leasing, and so it would be create a property tax exemption or abatement for residential properties that guarantee units will be affordable to comma and leased to comma individuals and families with incomes at or below 60% of AMI. Um, we felt that that the spirit of it as our, as we interpreted it was, um, it's both the affordability and the leasing. Um, you could have it be affordable without leasing to the individuals who need it, or you could have it not affordable and lease to. So we thought adding that punctuation clarified it and kept the focus on um, renting property. Those, those were the uh, specific comments we wanted to bring up or, and that those were our going, uh, that's what we were 
doing with those, um, but certainly open for comments um, at this point or further suggestions. Thank you very much. Well, well done. Um, Frank, you have your hand up? I, I do. I do. Uh, Brett, just for clarity, sec, uh, clarity on H265 for the inclusionary housing, before you get to an ordinance, don't you need to get 1522304 oh, of the state code amended to include James City County to be able to do an ordinance? That might be one uh, where um, Vaughn might uh, add something. I, I, I have a little bit of knowledge I can add in, um, but would maybe invite uh, Vaughn if that's okay with Brett. Yes. So I, I think as what we understand is that we are currently amenable to the ordinance or I'm sorry, the state code allows it now. It would be a matter of us adopting the ordinance. So it's not that we are precluded from participating in that part of the state code. We simply need to adopt the ordinance. I think we need a legal opinion on 15.22304, because I think the action is amend the language to say, because that's what I got out of the housing study when we got to this inclusionary housing issue. And it's important because what we wanna do in Croker for the higher densities, as an example, to be able to make sure we have affordable housing is to be able to put that policy in place like Charlottesville or Fairfax or Albemarle County. And right now, I don't think that state code allows us to do that unless it's amended. So I just ask that we look at that. And if it's true, then just put an action in there that says, as part of our legislative agenda, James City County wants to be included, which is what I think we were trying to do with the task force study. But, but anyhow, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may, this is Marion Payne. If I may, um, although 2304 does not apply to James City County, 2305 does, and it's very similar. It could be a step into the inclusionary zoning while we try to get the 2003, 2304 um, authorized for the county. Marion, thank you. That's very helpful. And you would know, you're a lawyer. Anyone else? Going once. Uh, is it the sense of everybody that this is fine as written uh, in, to include the several things that Brett mentioned earlier? I'm any, fine any, with that. Yeah. Any, any negatives, any, any opposition? Brett, I think you have um, our guidance that you have uh, that, that, that this is the way it uh, should be written and acceptable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that brings us to any other items for discussion? I think the chairman needs a compliment for getting us out by 630. <laughs> that wasn't hard, yeah. it was everybody. <laughs> thank you. Um, um, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good Thanks job, Thank, Thank you, you all. all. Thank you all.